Thank you. Okay, I'm not used to having to use these kinds of mics, so I apologize in what looks like a lot of ineptitude on this thing here. So uh, anyway, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We have a little formalities that we have to go through because this is a, a formal joint town council board of ed meeting. Uh, so we're going to go through a quick formality. Uh, we'll do the pledge together, and then we'll get into the substance of the evening. But I, I certainly want to welcome everybody here tonight, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I would like to call the special town council and joint board of ed meeting, 7 p.m. Thursday, March 8th, to order. Uh, Thorpe Auditorium, Cheshire, Connecticut. Um, roll call, Ms. Talbot. Mr. Bowman. Here. Mr. Falk. Here. Ms. Lynn Harris. Present. Ms. Nichols. Here. Mr. Orris. Here. have a quorum. Great, thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you all. Uh, and once again, I want to welcome you all uh, this evening. I, I wish we were here to talk about a happier subject, but unfortunately, uh, in light of the recent situation in Florida and some recent uh, things happening here in, in Cheshire, uh, we certainly, um, it's been weighing on all of us, obviously, and I think uh, what we wanted to try to do was make sure we had a public conversation about this. This is not just a Board of Ed issue, and it, it is incumbent on all of us, I think, to have a seat at this table. Uh, this is a big issue that we need to address as a community. It is a community issue as far as I think all of us are concerned. Uh, and the way that we're going to best tackle this issue uh, is to do it together and uh, to make sure that all of the stakeholders are here having a substantive dialogue about how we keep our children safe when they're in our schools. Uh, this, is a, this is a growing epidemic that we can no longer stick our head in the sand on, and I can tell you that you know, our Board of Ed and uh, the leaders of our community have done a great job uh, up to this point. Uh, but the reality is we can always do more. And tonight is not to talk about what we could be doing better necessarily in looking backward, it's about looking forward. Uh, I think we've done a lot of good things. Uh, we've invested in our schools to a certain extent, which you're gonna see uh, some of those things tonight. Uh, but again, we can always do more and we need to be doing more. And now is not the time to be sitting on the sidelines. Um, we all know this can happen anywhere. It can happen in our backyard. And uh, we all have a vested interest in this. Uh, so uh, we would be remiss as your elected officials if we were not having this conversation. Uh, in the end, a lot of things stop with the Board of Ed and, and the Town Council when it comes to budget or how we're educating our children and certain issues uh, pertaining to this community. But, but when it comes to our kids, we all have a seat at the table. And quite frankly, you elect us to be here. And we need to make sure we're responding to your wishes. And we're doing everything that you want us to do as your elected officials. And I can tell you, from me personally, I take that very seriously. And I think everybody sitting at this table does as well. And that's why we collectively wanted to be here this evening. Uh, this is a critically important topic uh, that we've been wanting to advance. And there's been a number of us that believe that, you know, this is a topic that we need to advance sooner than later. Uh, we need to begin this dialogue sooner than later. And towards that end, we started the process a couple of weeks ago. We had uh, a couple of town council members and board of ed member and some of the senior staff meet informally to begin this dialogue. We followed up on Monday, as many of you know, as an executive session uh, meeting between the joint town council and board of ed. Uh, I hope you all understand that we did this in executive session for confidentiality reasons. We unfortunately can't share everything we're doing with you in a community. It would probably counter, be counterproductive uh, to the end result of safety for the children. Uh, but by no means does that mean you shouldn't have a meaningful seat at the table. So we had a very meaningful dialogue on Monday night, um, and uh, I think a lot of things came out. Uh, there were a lot of people there. We had town council, board of ed. We had our public safety officials. We had uh, Superintendent Solon, Michael Milone, and his senior staff, uh, Vin Massiana and all his, his senior staff. Uh, all of the major stakeholders that, that are going to play a part in this were at this meeting, and we began a dialogue talking about how we're going to have to deal with this. I truly believe this is a comprehensive issue. We need to come up with a comprehensive plan. This is not just physical improvements to our school. We need to figure out how to deal with the mental health issue. 
Physical improvements at a school is certainly something. Maybe we need more, uh, you know, public uh, presence in the school, excuse me, police presence in the schools. Uh, certainly we need to be talking more about policies and procedures, how we're drilling, who we're drilling in the school systems, and making sure that everybody is up to speed and knowing what they need to do in the event of a, of a situation. And I know we're doing a lot of that already, but there's always more to do. And again, I want to underscore this. This is not about pointing the finger at anybody. This is about having a positive dialogue collectively to make sure we as a community are doing everything we possibly can do to make sure our kids are safe. There's enough stresses in this world today. We need to educate our children. We don't need them worrying about, you know, who's roaming the hallways that may, uh, may, may be looking to shoot at them or something along those lines. So uh, we need to protect these kids, and that's why we're all here tonight. So, again, I want to thank you all for being here. This is the first of what I hope will be many opportunities to voice your thoughts and opinions on this. Uh, we're going to try to fast track what we can fast track. Other things may take a little longer because just procedurally they may need to do. We may need to bring some outs additional outside support. Uh, we already have outside consultants working and they have. I know Vin Massiano will talk to you about it and, and uh, Superintendent Solon will. Uh, but the reality is um, this is just the beginning of what I think will be a heartfelt conversation for all of us as to how we keep not only this, the kids safe but our community safe. So thank you for being here. Uh, I appreciate it. And I'm now going to pass it over to Catherine Fabiani, the Vice Chair of the Board of Ed. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Orris. Um, and welcome to everyone. Um, uh, Kathy Hellreich, who's the chair of the Board of Ed, couldn't be here tonight and she apologizes for not being here. And she asked me to read this statement. Um, so, good evening. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for attending tonight's joint BOE Town Council Forum on School Safety. I've been a, board of, a member of the Board of Education for 10 years. Student safety has always been a priority. Every year we make safety improvements, some we can share, and for obvious reasons, others we can't. I think what has become more obvious over the years is that school safety requires a three-prong approach, the physical plant, mental health, and incident reporting. Tonight we will talk about all three from the professionals' perspectives, and then we'd like to hear from you, your thoughts, concerns, and suggestions. As Rob has said, tonight is the beginning of the dialogue that will continue in the days, weeks, and months ahead. As a community, we can all agree that the safety of our children is of utmost importance. And when I was um, getting ready for the meeting, you know, the one thing that I wanted to say was that um, at this point, you know, there may be several things that we as community members don't agree on, but this is the one issue that I think it's clear that we are all absolutely on the same page and have the same goal, which is how are we going to make sure we're doing what we can do, the best that we can do to protect the children of Cheshire um, and our whole community, actually. I mean, you know, this is not necessarily just a school building um, issue. It's sort of a town-wide public safety uh, issue. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I think this is it's wonderful that so many people were able to take the time and uh, come and hear where we are already and where we are hoping to get and to, again, listen to what you have to say. So with that, I will turn this over now to Mr. Solon. Thank you very much, Mrs. Fabiani. I just wanted to take a moment so that everybody in attendance could familiarize themselves with who is here this evening. Uh, I thought we could start with introductions. Uh, down on the council end, Mr. Rocco, do you want to begin? Well, Tom Rocco, Cheshire Town Council. David Velliber, Town Council. Sylvia Nichols, Town Council. Peter Talbot, Town Council. Patty Flynn Harris, Town Council. Jeff Falk, Town Council. Tim Slocum, Town Council. Paul Bowman, Vice Chairman, Town Council. Rob Orris, Chairman, Town Council. Catherine Fabiani, Vice Chair of the Board of Ed. Ann Harrigan, Board of Ed. Nita Vatti, Board of Ed. Adam Grippo, Board of Ed. Tony Perugini, Secretary, Board of Education. John Andrews, Fire Marshal. Neil Dreif, Police Chief. Don Youngquist, Deputy Fire Chief. 
Michelle Piccarillo, I'm the town's human services director. Uh, Tracy Hussey, I'm director of pupil personnel services, uh, principal of Humiston School. And I'm Vin Massiana, chief operating officer for the Cheshire Public Schools. And I'm Jeff Solon, I'm the superintendent of the Cheshire Schools. And I want to begin by thanking uh, everyone who attended tonight. I know the last couple of days have been really difficult in terms of weather and I appreciate you taking the time to share your concerns to learn more about what we do in terms of safety and security for our students and I, I particularly want to uh, thank our staff many of whom I, I see in the audience I appreciate you coming out as well we have designed this forum as an opportunity to share some of what has been done over the last several years to address school security and mental health as well as to solicit from our community what your concerns are and any suggestions you may have. This format gives us the best opportunity to hear as many concerns and suggestions as possible. Many people have already submitted information through our parent and staff survey, which was emailed earlier this week. Please know that anyone in our community can go to the Cheshire Public Schools website and click on the link to submit your own information. We will do our best to answer your questions without providing information that compromises our security through our website and future meetings. So at this point, I'd like to just give the council and board the opportunity. If you'd like to move to the, the seats, it might be easier to see. Before we move on, I want to sure. uh, introduce two more people who are critically important to this that uh, unfortunately we're not recognized, but our town manager Michael Milone is here, our assistant town manager Arnett Talbot is here also, and they have major stakes in this as well, uh, and you know, I just want to make sure that you know they're here. If you have any questions for them, they're sitting in the front row. I know they don't like the, the forefront, uh, but they do a lot of work for this community, and certainly you need to know who they are, and they are both here in the front, so thank you. All right, as we mentioned, we wanted to just take a little bit of time to go through some of the upgrades we've made to address our security over the last several years. Uh, we'll go through that process and then offer you the opportunity to make uh, suggestions about what we do or share concerns with us. We'll take that information and process all of the concerns that are shared this evening and the suggestions with the information that is shared through our staff survey and parent survey and we'll continue to work as a team to make suggestions to to improve what we do it's an ongoing process that we've engaged in for many years uh, as we started to plan this evening and how we were going to present to you the initial suggestion was the idea of having a slide where the fire department would talk about what they do and the police department would talk about what they would do and and we would segregate it out that way but we realized quickly that it's impossible to do that because we've worked so closely together for so many years that uh, we in the school system don't make a decision about security without consulting with law enforcement and the fire department and one might think you know security, what does the fire department have to do with that? We address many risks uh, from a safety perspective. Certainly, you know, Parkland, the idea of an armed intruder is really at the forefront of everybody's mind. But on a daily basis, we're very considerate of the variety of safety issues that could occur in a school system for our students. Everything from, you know, theft and, and fire being part of that, power loss is something unfortunately we've become more familiar with, but there are a myriad of things that we try and collaboratively work on to ensure a safe environment for our students and staff and our community. So 
all of us are really responsible for school security and safety. Uh, our administrators and the folks that work in our building are a critical part of that. Uh, school resource officer, which you'll hear about more later. Our emergency responders, both police and fire. The youth and social services. Uh, Chairman Orris talked about mental health being a critical component. And of course, our parents and students. So tonight, we're going to really talk about three basic com components to our school security and safety. One being the fortitude of our buildings, the, the physical building security itself. Another being incident management and how we respond to issues, a myriad of issues. And the third being mental health prevention and early detection. So with information on our, our building security, I'm going to pass it over to our Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Massiana. Thank you, Mr. Sullen, and good evening and welcome, everyone. Just by way of background, very quickly, my responsibilities for the school district include the management of facilities and grounds at our eight schools, budget administration, human resources and payroll, food and nutrition, the uh, student transportation and technology services. So the role of, of uh, my department is to provide the support services for the school district so that the educators and the administrators can do the important work of educating our students day in and day out. So really my role is operational and school security does fall within my responsibility realm. What I did want to share with you this evening, and it's on the slide, is school safety and security, you know, has been an effort that's been ongoing, you know, certainly since um, before I, I was here in, in the Cheshire Public Schools in 2010. Um, and I'm going to really talk through from 2012 forward. 2012 was the year of the uh, Sandy Hook shooting. And so from that point forward, we've done a number of things, and this is really what I want to reiterate, if nothing else, that the Board of Education, the school staff, the town council uh, have been working closely on making improvements over the years. So um, I will talk at a high level this evening about some of the things that we've done, starting with the larger improvements that we've made have been funded through our operating budget, uh, and also through our capital budget process. And the capital budget process requires approval of Board of Education and Town Council in order to um, provide the money that's needed to make physical building improvements. And the first part of my conversation is about physical building improvements. Um, you'll see on the slide that we received um, over the last four years two rounds of school security reimbursement grants. Those grants totaled $170,000. The reimbursement is 40% of the expenditures. So if you, you know, just kind of do the math, there's over $600,000 in improvements that have been made just from the capital budget improvements. There's been more than that from the operating budget, but I just want to give you a sense for the background that, that we have here on making improvements to the schools. And the, the 170000 in reimbursements received were reinvested to make additional improvements in the schools. The types of improvements we're talking about on the physical building side um, includes uh, upgrades to things like doors, locks, both mechanical and electronic door locking systems, uh, windows, and in general, the perimeter of each of our eight buildings. Um, as Mr. Solon mentioned, there's a lot of different risks that we try and mitigate through our school safety and security. So one of the things that I did uh, want to let everyone know, which I would assume most people know, is that we installed a permanent emergency generator at Cheshire High School. We did that over this past summer. That is up and running. It came in handy when we had a, a power outage at Cheshire High School uh, this past Friday. Um, and then beginning in the fall of 2018, one of the um, capital budget improvements that was approved is we will be installing the capability at all of our other schools, meaning, meaning Dodd and the elementary, so that if we lose power, the town has two uh, large emergency generators on wheels that we could bring up to a school and power that school. So we minimize the amount of downtime and can continue to operate school during the day. And then if you've been to the high school lately, you'll see that there's a new security booth staffed by our hall monitors 
as you enter the high school. So we are uh, working to um, have all visitors come through the front entrance at Cheshire High School. And again, those are some of the things that we've done on the physical building side. The other investments that have been made that were significant is to improve communication and building surveillance. And so this includes upgrades to the telephone systems, all new across the school districts, paging systems uh, in our schools. We've also upgraded the um, video surveillance capabilities that we have in our schools. Um, the video surveillance um, can be viewed live not only in school by the Cheshire Police Department as well through their dispatch center. And then other items include the uh, two-way radios that we use within each school. Those have all been upgraded. And there is a town-wide radio upgrade that was approved by the council and approved at voter referendum of over $3 million. And so the radios that were purchased for the schools that are used within each school building will have the ability, will have the ability to communicate with our emergency responders if so needed. And those are important pieces. If there is any type of event, the ability to communicate um, is something that we you know, have improved and we're looking to improve further. And again, I'm trying to give you a high level sense of some of the things we've done. I'm gonna move on to talk a little bit about what we're trying to do to get to the next level in terms of school safety and security. And that is, the um, improvement strategy. One of the things that you know, we recognize within um, our school community, and we do work closely with police and fire with those items in particular, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but you know, we don't have the expertise within our school district to do a, the type of review that we thought was necessary. So over this past summer, we hired an independent security firm that um, brought a new and a different set of eyes to each of our eight schools. And so a, re a review was done across each of our eight buildings with this independent security professional, members of our police and fire department, our school principals, and some of our staff from facilities and technology. And out of that review came a series of recommendations. So we have that in hand um, at this point. Um, as luck would have it for us, as we were working through the review, the state announced in, at the end of August a new round of school security grants, and we were able to take the items identified in the review and incorporated that into the school grant um, request. And those improvements, you'll see there in, in that, um, I guess, one, two, three, fourth bullet down, the improvements that we're looking to make further improve our physical plant. There'll be improvements in uh, building access, uh, the surveillance systems that we have, as well as visitor management and fire and safety capabilities. The grant amount um, is based on $1.19 million in expenditures. So that's the total of the items that we requested in the grant. Frankly, we were surprised that the state approved um, just about everything that we asked for in the grant. And the town, if we make that $1.19 million investment, would get about $497,000 in grant reimbursement. Um, and those grants um, cover expenditures we make through the year 2020. We are working with a school security task force that includes police, fire, and school staff to prioritize those recommendations within the scope of that grant. Um, so we, um, you know, we're working on that in earnest. and. The, as far as the approval for the $1.19 million in expenditures, that will go through our capital budget process, which we've already started working on. And to the extent that there are priorities, as Mr. Orris indicated, we may speed up some of those um, improvements. Moving on to a different topic. So what we talked about is physical building and communications improvements. Um, a second leg to what we do in the schools has to do with risk and incident management. So these, these are some of the procedural things that uh, we're responsible for in the schools. Um, as Mr. Solon indicated, we have a wide range of r risks that we have plans for. Um, so each school um, does have a school safety and security plan. 
Um, it is something that the school principals maintain, um, um, share with the staff. The plans themselves are based on the National Incident Management System, and it includes things like the procedures to follow if we have a shelter in place or a fire drill or a lockdown drill. Those plans are updated annually. Um, each school building has its own security team, and those teams do meet. And the important thing about the safety plans are the monthly drills that we do in each school. Each school, you know, does at least one monthly drill, a fire drill. Every, um, uh, we, could, we could supplement the fire drills with other types of drills, such as lockdown drills every third month, and, and we do do that. The thing that I want to stress is that when we do our drills, police and fire personnel are present. They review the drills. They provide feedback uh, in terms of recommendations, and then we take those recommendations and we uh, enact the recommendations so that we're going through this iterative process to improve the procedures that we follow. And the last um, point I want to make before turning it back to Mr. Solon is that we also work with um, our emergency responders on state and federal drills. So those take place with the town departments, Chespercott on some of the drills, with our, which is our local health district, our school officials, and some of the drills that we've done collectively include drills on um, tornadoes sweeping through our community, cyber attacks, and tomorrow actually is a mass dispensing drill that's taking place at Cheshire High School. You know, the scenario being if we had a uh, flu epidemic, how would we administer, um, you know, different types of, of drugs and, and, you know, get the community um, immunized? That's what we need to do. So, again, you know, in the, <clears throat> the consultant that Mr. Massiana talked about uh, validated this for, for us as well, that one of the greatest assets we have is that we have a, a very cohesive team between the town uh, emergency services, youth and social services, and our school system. And that allows us to have pretty seamless response. All these incidents happened within the last two to three years, um, you know, using CHS as a multi-day shelter with a major power outage. Um, we've had health issues, you know, things like the, uh, pardon the term, but black water toilet backup at CHS. Those are real issues that we have to respond to. Uh, carbon monoxide, we had uh, an issue just, it feels like three months ago, but I think it was this week at Chapman um, where there was the odor of natural gas and the school staff and the, the fire department and police department responded immediately, evacuated all the students, the fire department blocked off the street, kids were able to walk across the street, uh, you know, very calmly and did an incredible job responding to that, that concern. Thankfully, it just turned, to be, turned out to be a pilot light that was out and we were able to clear the building quickly, but the fact is that the fire department was there within a matter of minutes, the police department was there almost instantaneously and we were able to, to work through it. So there are a lot of issues that we prepare for and work very closely together on. With respect to mental health prevention and detection, one of the um, marquee issues that's come up more recently is our, our school resource officer. And uh, Chief Dreif, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the impetus behind that and what the motive was what, and, and what the role of that, that position is. Sure. Um, I, just to clarify one thing when it comes to the school resource officer, because there seems to have been some confusion, I think, uh, with the reporting out of Florida. Um, so the school resource officer here, that, that's a, it's a job title, right? Um, the officer, Sam DiCapua, is the school resource officer. He's a full-time Cheshire police officer. He is um, he's a regular member of the police department. He's armed, which is a question that I get every once in a while. Um, and you know, during the summer when he's not here, he is either a patrol officer out on patrol or uh, works in the investigative uh, division, you know, conducting investigations. So uh, there, there are 
different classifications in different parts of the country where a school resource officer might be some sort of auxiliary or part-time or uh, employed by the Board of Education or the school system and not the police department. Um, so just a point of clarification. Um, when I became the police chief here in January of 2011, we hadn't had a presence in uh, the high school for a, a little over a year at that point due to some staffing issues. So we were able to do some hiring. There was some hiring underway already when I, when I arrived. Um, we were able to complement that uh, with a little bit more. And one of the things that we started was, uh, again, with the permission of the former superintendent, Greg Florio, and with his support, was uh, assigning a police officer here uh, as the school resource officer. So that started uh, with Officer Lauren Weber. And the idea was to have a presence uh, of a Cheshire police officer interacting with kids in the school every day um, to the extent that we can. There are things that pull the school resource officer out of the school uh, periodically, most notably training. Um, Officers are required to complete 60 hours of training every three years to maintain their certification. Sometimes I, I can't always make that happen during the summer. So, uh, you know, and like everyone else, he gets vacation and days off and sometimes gets sick. But for the most part, he's here. He does spend some time at uh, the middle school and some time at Humiston also. But the vast majority, the bulk of his time is spent here at the, at the high school. Um, Again, start out with Officer Weber. The idea was uh, an officer would come in with a freshman class, work a four-year rotation here, and when that freshman class graduated, uh, then we'd, we'd bring in another officer. Again, two, uh, Officer DiCapio is now in his second year here. Uh, officer Weber went back to the patrol division after his four years. Um, the, the assignment of an officer here, in, in, in my opinion, and I think the, uh, the, the folks from the public schools would agree, has been a, an overwhelming success. They have, they, they do a lot more, you know, they're, they're not here to lock up your kids during the day for smoking in the boys' room or running in the hallways or anything like that. Um, although, I, I'm not to sugarcoat it, they, they do have some uh, responsibilities and arrests of students have been made for things that have happened in the building here. Um, they are, uh, the officer has been an invaluable resource in responding to incidents not just in school, but around town that have involved young people uh, over the course of the last six years or so. And it's, again, it's some, uh, what I said when we, when we originally went before the council to ask for the, uh, you know, approval to assign the officer was, I want it to be a situation where kids who grow up in Cheshire think of it as, you know, they can name the principal, they can name their social studies teacher, they can name their guidance counselor, and they can name the school resource officer. Um, I think that should be part of growing up and going to school here um, and anywhere uh, for that matter. Uh, I think it helps to establish relationships, break down barriers, um, and again, you know, it's not all, it's not all touchy-feely. The officer here has, has brought um, vital information to investigations that we've been conducting uh, town-wide um, as well as, uh, you know, the, the role that I think we, you know, we, we talk about tonight is the role that we absolutely hope that he or she never has to do, and that is to provide a, an immediate response to a threat or an active incident that's going on uh, here in the school. So uh, again, that's part of the deal. As I said, they are, uh, you know, Officer DiCapua and Officer Weber before him regular sworn members of the police department, uh, sworn certified police officers in the state of Connecticut. It's not some, you know, program that we have where we, you know, where we hire somebody, you know, unarmed or anything like that, which it can be in other parts of the country. So, again, I'll, I'll be here for the whole thing, and I'm happy to take any questions later or after the meeting or at any time, but that's just kind of an overview of what we, uh, what our intent was in, in, uh, assigning a school resource officer here to the high school. Thank you very much, Chief Dre. And you know, as a former principal here, I can echo your comments that not only does the officer play a role in, in setting a tone in the building and, and uh, being a legitimate Cheshire uh, police officer, but also uh, is very involved in connecting with students. 
and sharing things. And it's, in my mind, it's another person that our kids can feel safe reporting something to, and that is uh, certainly critical. So uh, other resources that we use for prevention and detection, Gaggle is a <coughs> overlay within our uh, Google platform. So when students type things into a, a Gmail or um, into a Google account, Google Drive account, whether it be Google Sheets or, or Docs, those things um, are ultimately filtered by this Gaggle software. So when there are things that come up like guns or suicide and certain flag words, uh, the Gaggle team reviews that document to make sure right, maybe this is a, a report the child is doing on suicide. They evaluate that document and if it's something of uh, serious concern, the school and police can be immediately contacted. They will call and they have on, on several occasions since we've instituted this um, for self-injurious behavior or um, other concerns, they'll reach out to the police department and to the school system so that it can be immediately addressed. Uh, one of the other things that we really try and emphasize with our students is student engagement. And, you know, we all know, you know, if a student is not hooked into things, that's not positive. We want them hooked into a sport, a club, uh, athletics, music, whatever, um, the play, you know, there are a variety of uh, different activities that we offer for our students. And you'll hear a little bit more about the developmental asset survey later, but in our most recent survey of kids that are in Cheshire, that were in seventh to twelfth grade, it's eighty percent of them uh, reported being in some sort of club or athletic event three or more hours a week, and twenty percent indicated that they were in music three or more hours a week. So it is important to us to make sure our students are engaged in positive life activities, and for us, if we see somebody who's not, that's uh, something that we make effort toward to get them involved in something and, and have a positive peer connection. Um, part of what we do is team, core team screening at the high school. Uh, this year we had four, we've seen 47 referrals thus far where um, parents or uh, staff members, it could be the person who's the lunch aide or it could be a teacher or when they see concerning behavior, changes in behavior, uh, when they see the student maybe is, is just not themselves lately, they can make a referral. Uh, or if the student is saying things that are of, of any sort of concern, they can make a referral. A team of mental health professionals and administrators process that and come up with a plan to support that child and, and then ultimately the family. Uh, families may also refer to that. Uh, at the middle school, it's very similar, but it's at a team level. Uh, where teams can process those sort of concerns. And uh, finally, uh, I shouldn't say finally because there are other things, but another primary area that we've tried to focus a little bit more on is community outreach. So in the fall, we had screenagers. Um, we're, you know, I met with the townwide PTA on Tuesday night. They had a variety of really good suggestions to support support parents in terms of community outreach and education, uh, everything from social media to um, how to talk to your students about different events. And, uh, and so what we're working toward is finding more opportunities for community outreach to help educate parents. It's something that we've done in the past, but I think now we're trying to look specifically at different areas to support uh, our parent community with the next one focused on mental health. We did a mental health outreach program at Cheshire High about three or four years ago. It was incredibly well attended and uh, we, we're looking to reinstate that again in the near future. So for more with uh, mental health, I'll pass it over to our PPS director, Ms. Hussey. Good evening. Uh, what I want to do is just talk first uh, programmatically, uh, just so you get a feel for what things look like um, in our buildings. 
Uh, all of our buildings um, have a system that's in place for uh, addressing issues of mental health. Uh, all schools have access to school psychologists, uh, guidance counselors uh, at the secondary level from uh, Dodd up through the high school. There are also social workers that do a lot of bridging uh, with communication with families as well. So uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about some of the highlights of intervention uh, and response. Uh, and uh, if anybody is interested in any type of follow-up into any of the things that are mentioned, I'm happy to follow up with you uh, in another conversation as well. Um, at the elementary level, uh, what we, what, you know, some of the proactive measures that are in place, uh, you know, we have faculty that are trained in responsive classroom. Uh, we have faculty this year that are learning more about ruler and mindfulness. Uh, a few of our elementary buildings follow the Look for the Good campaign. Um, all of our uh, faculty across the district uh, participated, um, key members from buildings participated in mental health first aid training this year. Uh, and the hope there is that each of those representatives are going to be going out into um, their building community and working with uh, the cafeteria workers, the transportation drivers, uh, the playground assistants, um, the teacher assistants, the hall monitors, so that every single person that encounters our students knows what to look for and how to respond and who to, who to communicate and uh, give information to, which is really those related service providers uh, in the buildings that they can follow up. Um, and that was a, you know, a K through 12 initiative this year. Um, our guidance department at the elementary level does fantastic lessons um, that, that work on uh, all different areas of having students grow um, and be self-aware and uh, make responsible decisions and uh, be kind to each other. Uh, you know, the focus is making sure that they understand, um, you know, aspects of respect and how to treat each other. Uh, at the, once again, elementary through secondary, um, all of our buildings have teams of people that are uh, PMT trained, which stands for Psychological Physical Management Training. So that's a training that's very specific to addressing issues of behavior that are unsafe. So if uh, a student, um, you know, is, is exhibiting something, whether it be an aggressive act or an act of self-harm uh, or uh, aggression towards uh, themselves or someone else, uh, we have a team that looks at how to de-escalate that, uh, as well as really trying to focus in on reading antecedents that um, can be, uh, you know, looked at and de-escalated before it becomes unsafe. Health initiative as well. Um, as you look at this slide, uh, on the top you kind of focus in on the proactive measures that all of our students have access to. Um, once again, at the middle school level, uh, mindfulness and look for the good. Um, our guidance lessons continue. Um, the middle school introduces advisory, so each student uh, is exposed to a teacher that they can form a connection with, and it's a, a smaller group. Uh, they have student advocates that are trained to kind of be ambassadors to students, and will sometimes assign those student advocates to help and assist. Um, and then uh, the developmental asset uh, survey was given uh, in 2015, December of 2015, and uh, we utilize that data to look at where our students kind of view themselves as far as their um, developmental assets. Uh, at the secondary level, once again, mindfulness is very uh, embedded within um, the high school uh, curriculum, and a lot of the teachers utilize uh, mindfulness in their classroom lessons. Uh, advisory continues, and we have peer health advocates at the high school as well. And once again, um, these student groups, the peer health advocates, the link crew, um, they're all students that, that really kind of serve as a link and a resource or even a buddy um, to students that are, that are in need of some support. Um, this year, the uh, Cheshire High Connection uh, Mentor Program began, and uh, it's overseen by a social worker at the high school. And uh, it's volunteers of teachers, faculty members, uh, it can be anybody that works uh, at the high school, and they mentor a student once a week, and those students were identified as 
um, students coming into uh, Cheshire High School from eighth grade that, that, that could really benefit from having an adult that can kind of foster and build a relationship with them. Um, at the bottom, uh, from the elementary right through middle school and secondary, those are more tailored therapeutic interventions. Um, as I mentioned, the school psychologists are available um, to consult and meet with students. Uh, they have group-based counseling, individual counseling. Uh, we do crisis interventions, so when issues are brought up, um, you know, from teachers or parents or students themselves, um, there's, a, there's a process to that, that our staff knows um, how to intervene, how to counsel, how to interview, uh, and then what types of supports are needed in moving forward. Um, very strong communication takes place. Uh, and then appropriate referrals is needed. Uh, our related service providers as well as our administrators uh, work very uh, well with providing resources that families can then seek out um, in our community, um, you know, such as counseling uh, and then as well as agency services, um, DCF voluntary services, uh, DDS, DSS. So um, at the middle school level, once again, so, uh, there's a social worker. Um, right now, there's actually two social workers that are at the middle school. Uh, one just began, a uh, second social worker was hired in January, so that's been a great addition um, to Dodd Middle School. We have pet therapy that takes place at Dodd Middle School. One of our social workers has two um, dogs that are very often roaming the halls, and the kids react uh, very, very uh, well with the dogs. Um, that group-based counseling and individual counseling are often recommended. Um, the communication, of course, continues uh, up through the secondary level with two full-time school psychologists that are available in the building, two social workers that are always in the building. Um, pet therapy also occurs at the high school uh, as well as that counseling component. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention uh, is that there's a referral process when um, issues of mental health become very impactful. And uh, a lot of the decisions that are made uh, based on some of those issues are through the uh, PPT process. Um, so very often students uh, that are in significant need um, have an IEP that's developed um, that supports them, uh, develops goals that the students can then work towards. They have a case manager and very often a related service provider, whether it be a counselor, a guidance counselor, or a social worker, or a psychologist uh, that they work very closely with. Okay. So I'm gonna speak to you um, for just a moment about some of the community supports that we provide on the town side through the Human Services Department. Um, the Human Services Department focuses on the emotional and mental well-being of all of our residents across the lifespan. For, for the purposes of tonight, I'm going to talk mainly about the services that we offer to our youth and families. We work very closely with the public school system to provide a variety of programs and services that are focused really on um, early identification of at-risk youth, referral to appropriate resources, and increasing community engagement for our young people. Um, so the first service I'm going to speak about is the Crisis Intervention Unit. Our department has somebody on call 24-7 to respond to a community crisis. That might be a situation typically where the police involved and they might respond to a domestic violence call or a call where there's child abuse and neglect, a hoarding call, um, unsafe li living conditions. Sometimes it's a death notification and we manage grief and loss. And our role in those situations is to go into the situation, try to help support the people involved, and then make sure that they get the follow-up resources that they need to move forward through whatever tragic experience they faced. Um, our Youth and Family Counseling Division, we have a staff of clinicians and graduate level interns who counsel any school-age child and their families in this community on a variety of different issues. We work very closely with the schools, again, in terms of the referrals. Um, typically, they do come from the guidance offices at the middle and high schools, and sometimes even from the elementary schools. We deal with a variety of issues, um, from divorce to eating disorders, depression, anger management, um, and typical adolescent issues. Um, 
we also work very hard to create a, a network of area mental health providers that we're comfortable referring to so that if an issue presents itself that we are not in a position to manage or that requires a higher level of care, um, we're able to refer to somebody that we, we know and um, we know what their specialties are. So we host a networking breakfast um, biannually and put together a comprehensive clinical directory that includes people's insurance and specialty, specialties, the populations they serve. Um, so we have a really nice network in this community of mental health support. Our juvenile review board um, is a group of community members who serve as um, a board that reviews cases for young people, juveniles, who are facing arrest for a non-felonious offense. Typically, it's a first offense. Um, and rather than sending them to court, they are referred to the juvenile review board. They attend a meeting um, of community members where we hear their case and we are able to then deliver interventions to them which might include mandated counseling or drug testing, a service learning project, um, providing an edu educational resource for their peers based on whatever, whatever offense it was that they'd committed. Um, that program is incredibly effective at identifying kids who are just starting down the wrong path and then diverting them and hopefully pointing them in the right direction. Uh, we offer a variety of drug and alcohol education and prevention programs from community awareness programs to counseling um, and referrals. Uh, one of them that I'd like to mention specifically is called our substance abuse education program and that is an alternative to suspension program that we work in conjunction with the schools where if a young person um, is caught in possession of alcohol, tobacco or other drugs on school property or at a school event, they typically would be suspended for 10 days. Um, that suspension is reduced to five days provided they participate in a four session counseling program with one of our clinicians. Um, parents are provided to participate as well and if they successfully complete that program, um, they're able to um, complete their suspension period with just the five days. Um, the beauty of that program is it also identifies kids who typically are first time offenders, are just starting down the wrong road, and we're able to intervene early, and if there is a need for referral to further treatment, we're in a position to provide that um, following that four session program. Um, we offer a variety of positive youth development and substance-free alternative activities through the Yellow House, which is across the street from the high school. Um, we have opened those programs up to pretty much any school-age child at this point in this community. Um, they include mentoring programs, leadership development programs, um, and in addition to that, we offer programs that provide kids a safe uh, socialization environment on Friday and Saturday nights. So they can come to the Yellow House for whatever um, activity, sometimes it's a movie night or an ice cream social, whatever it might be, and it's supervised and they're healthy socialization opportunities, um, which helps to engage kids with other kids in the community, sometimes from different schools, particularly at the elementary level. And we also have older mentors who serve as volunteers for our programs. So they see um, leaders and older kids, which is always really helpful for youth development. Um, and then you've heard mention the 40 developmental assets. Um, and as um, Tracy mentioned, in 2015, we did do a survey um, of students in grades seven through 12 focused on the 40 developmental assets. And the developmental assets were developed by the Search Institute, which is an institute out in Minnesota. And essentially, they're internal and external ass assets that a young person needs to possess in order to become a healthy, successful adult. Um, so they might be a sense of community, high self-esteem, community engagement. Um, there are a variety of different things to look at. And the survey that we administered, um, the focus of that was to determine which assets our kids have in this community um, that are very strong and which might be a little bit weaker. Um, and so we hope to resurvey again, um, hopefully this coming fall. Um, that will provide us with sort of some comparative data um, to compare to 2015 and see how we're doing in terms of building up those assets and identi you know, identifying the weaknesses and making those areas stronger. Um, the, that program is focused on the, on the idea that the more assets a young person possesses, the less likely they are to become engaged in risky behaviors. So to the extent that we as a community can develop those assets in our young people, the less likely our young people will be to get into trouble or get involved in illegal or risky behaviors. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, you know, the parent role, as I indicated from the outset, is critical. Uh, you are important partners with us in this process of supporting our students and making sure that we have a safe school environment. Uh, you know, a lot of these items that I'm going to go through 
uh, came out of the, the conversation that I, I had the other night with some of our parents, our PTO representatives on Tuesday night. Uh, this is something I hear for our students and staff. I think, you know, every day that passed after Sandy Hook, there was a, a comfort that crept in. And it's important for us to take our drills very seriously and, you know, supporting that at home can mean also making sure that our children are aware of their situation. And that can mean um, like a see something, say something idea. If you, you know, see something that's out of place, I have that level of awareness to, to report it. Um, but it also can mean, you know, geez, I've, I've sat with Sparky every day for the last three months for lunch, but he hasn't shown up for lunch for three days. Something, something doesn't feel right, you know, and to say something there. So um, just talking to our kids about that sort of situational awareness uh, can be really helpful. Uh, again, if you see something, hear something, say something. And that is um, really, uh, again, we're partners in this process. If your child expresses something to you or you, you see a social media post, you know, that you're, somebody had made on, on an account that your child has access to or something, please report that. If it doesn't feel right to you as mom or dad or, or grandma or grandpa, whoever, it, it's probably not right. And at the very least, let somebody know and investigate it so you can report it to your child's school. Um, you can contact the police department, uh, our uh, school resource officer, Officer DeCapua, you can call him. Uh, there are definitely a lot of ways to report, and that was another um, point that our parents made to me the other night, that they want to know more about how to report and what to report and who to go to. Um, so that'll be another outreach in the, in the near future. Please re reinforce responsible use of social media. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a joke posted that just, you know, is, is really inappropriate. And whether it's, you know, your child is the, the recipient or, you know, God forbid, the poster. You know, kids make mistakes. They're, they're going to do things. But... The impulsivity of social media um, can be, you know, can have more lasting consequences today. So I, you know, ask that you have conversations with your children around that. Uh, that was, again, another area that the parents expressed to me. Uh, and how do I use Snapchat? Uh, you know, what, what's a streak in, in Snapchat? That's the number of times, consecutive days that you and a Snapchat friend have sent messages to one another as a streak. You know, ask your kids, who's your streak, who's your greatest streak with, who's your longest streak, who'd you just start a streak with? And they might look at you funny like, what the heck, you've never asked me what a streak was before, but you know, it, it's good to have those conversations with our kids um, and it's a, another positive life lesson. Uh, toward that end of, of responsible use, we are exploring um, digital citizenship uh, instruction at the elementary grades to start to work with our students hopefully before they have these cell phones in their hands um, and coach them more about appropriate use of that technology. And uh, finally one last request to school visits. I, I remember when I was principal here forever ago we had a real run of people delivering coffee to their kids on a daily basis, as crazy as that sounds, like who has time for that? But um, we ask that you could please limit your visits to the schools, particularly as we're trying to work on um, improving our reception security. If you could try and limit that to really more urgent uh, visits, that'll help us improve our, our capacity to, to better um, to better assess who's coming in and out and also you know just focus our resources a little bit better and, and we certainly appreciate that so at, at this point as I said at the beginning tonight is an opportunity for you to and we encourage you to express what your concerns are and any suggestions you may have um, you know we this is one the first of you know a conversation so 
tonight really there isn't an opportunity for a lot of give and take uh, out of respect for the audience we ask that you try and keep your um, suggestions and comments to, to three minutes because we want to try and get as much feedback as we can this evening and again I encourage you if either you, you don't want to or don't have the opportunity to, to speak tonight we want you to um, take advantage of the online survey just by visiting our website you can submit that and uh, that's welcome so if the members of our council and board want to come back forward and if you would like to um, express a comment or a concern we invite you to step to the microphone and please state your name and address for our record and um, you can share what whatever you wish thank you Please. <clears throat> Rob Bricado, I uh, live on Wolf Hill. I uh, was born and raised in Cheshire, went through the school system in Cheshire. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed over the time is <clears throat> when walkers and kids that miss the bus or you get dropped off of the bus, uh, I noticed that at Chapman, and I haven't looked at other schools, uh, they're forced to stay outside. There's no one watching them. They're waiting at the doors. Maybe they got there a little early. Uh, when I went to school here, you were on a bus, the bus pulled up, dropped you off, you went right into the school. You were a walker, you rode your bike, you went right into the school after locking up your bike or walking in. I don't understand what's going on here and why our kids are left outside. I know during the storms or when it got cold weather, there was a couple days that they said, oh, we'll let the kids in for a couple days, we'll go back to let them stay outside. That's unsafe, it makes no sense. That's a process that could be changed now. <clears throat> open the schools, let the kids come in half an hour early. The buses should just drop the kids off, go in, and not be waiting with buses outside. We also have, at Chapman, I see six, seven buses. Someone can drive by, shoot the kids in the buses if, if there's crazies out there. We need better protection that way. Uh, something that happened the other morning, I was waiting outside for the bus to come from my daughter. The bus came from a different direction, at a different time, was late. I didn't even recognize the bus driver. So we, we're never really get an opportunity to meet who our children's bus driver is going to be to get to know them. Uh, I did that on my own with the bus driver the first day, but maybe that's something we can look at. You get to learn that bus driver or even notify if the bus driver is going to be out so you know something's changed. Because the bus came another way, I was a little wary. The time was off. It was late. So I sort of waited around to see where the bus went just to make sure it wasn't someone took the bus picking up the kids. There was only two other kids on the bus, so it bothered me. So. <clears throat> that's something there uh, and in this meeting I noticed you said having the kids involved uh, if there's families that can't get the kids around to do sports maybe that's the reason they can't be in sports or be in ap after school activities do we have transports to help these kids get around either other families get involved to let these kids join that might be something we can look at uh, when I went here I don't remember having anything available unless you were friends with somebody to do that uh, and then you mentioned lessons on drills and teaching our kids and, and helping out in there. Uh, I don't get anything back from the school saying, this is the lessons, this is how we're gonna teach lockdowns or fire drills, more for the lockdowns. So I don't know what to teach my kid. After the school shooting in Florida, I gave her some ideas of what to do in the class. I know the classroom told her where to go hide if the teacher couldn't tell them to do something or go out a window or whatever the possibilities are. It might be good to give us what you're going to teach so we can help enforce that or, or strengthen that at home. But thank you. Thank you, Russ. Hi, my name is Pam Ghazi. Um, new to Cheshire, lived here for a couple of years. Um, we own a business in town. My son attends Darcy. Um, I had a couple of ideas. I'm a psychologist myself. Um, I find that kids respond to positive reinforcement, and I think you have set up nicely referrals for children who are seeking mental health services um, or don't need that they don't know that they need to be seeking it but you have these kids who are basically struggling and it would be nice at the end of the year you probably all have award ceremonies to maybe award a student that you know that's gone through some things um, who've come through it maybe you could call it a perseverance award something that's not based on academics but it's based on 
um, emotional perseverance. That's something they can hang their hat on for a little while to get them through the next grade and the grade after that. Some positive reinforcement for making it through emotional struggle. And I really think that the student advocates that you have starting in high school could start younger uh, or middle school. So our middle school starts a little later than most middle schools start in sixth grade. I think student advocates could start as early as nine years old um, when brains are well developed enough to understand that other people could be having trouble. And we can teach nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds to recognize what that looks like within themselves and other people. And they could probably help teachers and others identify students who might be struggling as early as nine. So, but I think your program is very nice. Um, the only other concern I had is what happens to students who are expelled. When they're kicked out of school, what do we know about them? Where do they go? What happens to those students? Okay. Again, you know, we can put some of these responses up on our website too. If anybody else. Hi, my name is Nicole Breton. I work here at the high school. So I have a concern about the very last topic that you were talking about. We do have a lot of parents that come in to bring, whether it be coffee, water, lunches. We have siblings that come in that bring bagels, breakfast, everything like that. The, my concern is we don't know what's in those bags. We don't know. We have parents come in bringing prescription drugs. It's in bags. The kids are meeting them down there. There is a great distance between that second pair of doors that doesn't lock to the, I guess, security or whatever you want to call it. You can reach the commons, and I'm responsible for 230 to 250 kids that are mine. And I don't want anything happening to them. And right now, we're kind of confused on what I do with my kids if some shooter would come in. And I'm worried. And they can go right to the cafeteria because they're, that person is behind that wall. My suggestion is, can we get that second door locked? Can we put a table out in that foyer area that if a kid needs that frappuccino, so badly. Can they set it down on that table? If it disappears, it disappears. They take that chance. If they forgot their hockey gear or my child forgot their swim gear, it's there. But I think parents who come in to the school should have an appointment, not dropping off a water bottle. You can buy water. You can buy food there. It's not too shabby. So we have a lot of suggestions. There's a lot of stuff there. We just have so many visitors. And sometimes Sam's not there. Sometimes he's behind closed doors. I'm very concerned. I think those doors need to be locked. And I think there's a, the table should be there. We ask the people that come in, do you have an ID? Everyone has an ID. What if somebody, a shooter has an ID? We don't know, we don't check, we don't say, do you have an appointment? What are you here for? We just ask, do you have an ID? So I'm concerned. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on that. So what you're suggesting is if I come in with my ID, they let me in, I have unfettered access to the entire building at that point? Is that the way it currently is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you have Just an ID. Just procedurally, I want to understand that because it would seem to me it would make sense that they should be reporting through some main office of some sort to make sure that you can't wander around. And if I want to deliver a frappuccino to my child in room 312, I shouldn't be able to do that, I wouldn't think. Well, you can come in. You set it down in the main office. Hopefully you just go, hopefully yeah. you just go to the main office. Yeah, well we don't turn around and look and make sure you go there. Well, I think your point's you a great point. We should be hurting most visitors through some central area to make sure that they're screened at that point as to where specifically they're going. I mean, that once you get through that ID recognition that they're not wandering anywhere in the building. Right. They have a sticker now, and it just says, well, we don't know where you're going. I mean, we could have five, six people walking around with stickers on. Right. And we don't have a time limit. We don't say how long you'll be there. Yeah. You I know? think you raise a really good point. Thank you. Yeah, thank I'm you. not sure I have the answer for it, but 
I think it's a good point. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I would just I would just clarify when people come in. Yes, they they show their ID. They go to the security kiosk, and then the then they report to wherever they're supposed to be. Um, and somebody could just I guess run around the building at that point. They're not um, escorted one to one. Good evening. My name is Bob Osborne. I'm on Flagler Avenue here in Cheshire. I have two sons, um, the youngest of which was a first grader when Sandy Hook happen happened, and the oldest is a freshman here at the high school now as Parkland happened. And uh, I recently went to work for a company um, called Mutual Link, and um, I went to work for this company because it has the opportunity to make a difference in these types of situations. Uh, Mutual Link has um, developed a platform, they call it IRAP. It's an interoperability response and preparedness platform. It's being used by the DOD, it's being used by Homeland Security, it's being used by states uh, throughout the country, uh, most notably uh, New Jersey, Rhode Island, uh, New York. Uh, we're in New York City, we are, um, but the system has the ability to tie in real time in a communications platform uh, disparate uh, groups um, into a temporary, um, uh, uh, to a temporary uh, platform. So basically different silos can be pulled in temporarily um, and tie in real time with audio, uh, with your radios, phones, mobile devices, video, which is camera feeds, mobile phone feeds, drone feeds, uh, video off of the mobile phones as well, data files like floor plans, uh, text, and GPS data. So all helping first responders in an active shooter type situation or any other type of an emergency scenario where uh, we can cut down response time significantly. So where Cheshire has made some uh, amazing um, has worked to build out their uh, platforms. This is kind of like the next level where we can take all of those disparate platforms, including platforms from other towns. So if you need to pull in other fire departments, if you need to pull in other police departments, uh, if you need to pull in the real-time crime center with uh, Sergeant O'Hare in Hartford, our system's already in there. Um, and what we can do is we can bridge all of those in a temporary uh, conference, if you will, uh, keeping those silos separate so everybody keeps um, domain over their own networks. So it's something like, like that that I would like to offer our services to the town of Cheshire. I'm a longtime resident and I've worked with the town of Cheshire for many years, but I finally took a job where I feel like our products can make a difference. We can save children, uh, we can cut response times, and um, if anyone has any questions about that, I'd be happy to take them after. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Lisa Dempsey, um, long-term resident. Uh, we have three kids in the school systems, in the elementary schools, and um, just to comments, I guess, or suggestions. Um, you said you would have the school resource officer in the high school as a permanent presence, which I think is wonderful. Um, I was just wondering if that was something that would carry over into the, um, the you know, all the other schools. Um, I just think the presence is just, um, it's just a, sorry, <laughs> um, a good feeling all over for parents, students, teachers, everyone, and I just think it's, maybe would make someone think twice. Um, just wanted that same comfort level that the high school has in all the schools. And also for some of the schools that are right on, um, I mean, mainly Chapman, that's where our kids go, um, right on the main road, um, is there any possible way of getting any kind of like a security barrier between Route 10 and a playground? Um, it just seems kind of open. I know Doolittle is also on it, and I'm probably forgetting other schools, I'm sorry. But uh, any kind of blockade between the public and our kids. So that's all. I think everything you guys are suggesting and commenting is, is great, but thank you. Thank you. All set? 
Um, if we, I'd like to just respond to the, re, the, the SRO request. Uh, you had mentioned about the possibility of additional uh, school resource officers. That is something that we're currently talking about at the town council level. Uh, our 49th officer, if we hire uh, at this point, and I think we can all agree that it's it's potentially going to be that next SRO, which would, would go into Dodd. And, and then between the two, hopefully they could facilitate more frequently through uh, the balance of the school. So it's something that still has to get worked out at the town council level, but it is something we're, we're having conversation on. And, I can tell you, I certainly support it. I'm only one of nine, uh, and I certainly don't want to suggest that I'm speaking for the balance of the council, but it is something that's eminently on our agenda at this point, and uh, I think you'll see some reaction to that pretty quick. Thank you. Good evening, Elizabeth Sullivan from Sherwood Lane in Cheshire. Been in uh, the town of Cheshire for tw almost 30 years now, and I have m mostly two uh, questions, really. Um, First of all, I want to thank you for all the information that you provided to tonight. I, I think I learned a lot about what we're doing, and the plan looks very comprehensive to me. But what I wonder about is effectiveness of everything that we're doing. And I, I mean, when I think about the events of last week, particularly at the middle school, I'm wondering if any of the pieces that we've put together had maybe put a red flag on that particular incident where maybe we could have done something more. So what I'm saying is, do the programs we have, are they effective at incidents like we had this week? Um, and in the spirit of continuous improvement, I wonder, you know, all the programs that we have and everything we're doing, all of that takes time and energy and taxpayer money. And I'm just wondering if we have the right programs and if we're thinking about how to continuously improve those programs. And, and lastly, I'd like to know, um, you know, I, I, I wonder what we can, as parents, could be doing more of. I noted that you said a number of times that that the community is important, but what can we be doing um, to help this situation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, go ahead. Hi. Tanaz Modi from Applewood Drive. Um, I moved here five years ago because my child was also in Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in kindergarten, and my friend's children were in, for, were in first grade. And uh, I'm very proud that I can actually be here tonight because it's very hard for me to talk about this, and I'm pretty private, but um, I'm very thankful, and I just want you all to know, number one, I've never felt safer in Cheshire since I've moved here. Um, some of the police officers in this room have met me before when I had a panic attack when I was walking down um, at open house when I moved to Chapman. And I'll never forget my principal, Miss Solano, holding my hand because I just couldn't walk down the first grade hallway. And she took me under her wing and has been very private about me coming into school. I have never felt safer. I believe in our police force. I believe on the first responders. Um, I do think from what I've seen lately, I guess my comment is there's a disconnect between mental health and parents. Um, I see children in my kids' school now, and I've, I have friends from Sandy Hook that are now all going to middle school that were in the shooting that are severely challenged right now and going through a lot of mental health issues. And some of the parents are brushing it under the rug and they don't know what to do. So that's number one. And I see in elementary school too that I really believe that it's mental health and helping our parents cope with that um, to make our teachers be able to cope with those children. That's number one. Number two is I have some feedback on the most recent lockdown drills. I didn't even know what I was gonna say when I came up here, but I just had to say something. But I am so thankful that we have the lockdown drills. I believe in them. My son Zal's the first one to say, mommy, we had a drill. And when I watch the news, you know, when someone comes out like that, that's a trigger for me, so I don't watch the news. But I'm so thankful for it, but I don't think other parents, a lot of mothers have been coming to me and fathers 
they don't understand what that drill entails. And I know that's a difference because I've been through a real one between a fire drill and an actual lockdown drill. I believe the lockdown drill might take longer, but I really would appreciate perhaps if we could educate parents on not what you do during lockdown. I don't want you to tell us. I really don't. I, I believe that should be kept between you and the police and the school superintendent. But I'm seeing mothers panicking. They're having panic attacks. They're calling me for everybody. Um, and I'm telling them, go to school. I sent my kid to school on Monday after Cheshire, um, after, I'm sorry, after uh, the high school. So I feel it's time that I help now. It's been five years. I'm proud of myself um, for coming here. And if I could be an advocate for safety in this town, I've never felt more safe. So thank you. Thank you, we appreciate your courage. That's a tough one to follow. Um, <laughs> and really appreciate that, that was very, very moving. Uh, Bruce Linder, I live on Ashley Court, been here 20 years, um, and I, in my uh, role, I'm responsible for compliance, assurance, and risk for information security for a large mortgage insurance company. So I appreciate um, everything that you're doing and the thorny nature and the difficult nature of what you're doing. And, I, and thank you very much for the things that you have stood up here, um, including the drills, uh, the focus on the mental health. I have two comments. One is tactical, one is strategic. Um, the tactical one, um, my wife actually, the day after the incident, uh, went in and had to drop off something, I think it was skates for my son, did not have any license check, you know, pushed the button, they let her right in, and didn't check. And she came back, told me, I said, well, you know, and in my training, I'm like, see something, say something. It doesn't do any good to tell me. Wrote a very nice note, and um, the principal wrote back, yep, we should have done that. We'll reinforce it. We're looking into it. And I hear that in some of the other stories here, and it tells me there's, we need to lock that down. That's a, the, the most simple thing we could do. Um, it's from a policy, a control, a testing type way. You know, do a penetration test. Any one of you go in, see how far you get, and see what happens. And you'll see how easy it is. So that's the tactical. But in the overall framework, something like that should go on a risk assessment that you manage. I'm a little concerned that, um, you know, there's an outsourcing. And I can understand if you don't have the very specific skill sets on the physical, that's great. Bring in outside experts. But someone, I don't know who here has to own governance and risk assessment. And when incidents like that happen, they need to go on a list and you kind of say, well, what happened? What could we do better? And there's some kind of actionable outcome. And maybe it wasn't covered tonight, but I'm not getting that all the parts are connected, kind of like the cybersecurity framework, where it's a very mature process. So from the strategic standpoint, I'd ask, are you following any kind of standard governance and risk management model, and are you actively managing it? Because the risk management, it's great to do this kind of forum. This is a one-time type thing, but this should be happening on an ongoing basis with someone owning it, and you'll learn and get better. You don't have to be, you know, it, there are no special skill sets necessarily. Again, I'll use that, that example of someone just walking right in. You've heard at least two Two uh, examples of that tonight. So, what are, you know, where do you stand on risk management, governance, ownership, and alignment with some kind of mature model that's out there? Thank you. Anybody? I don't want to be the only one always talking, but I mean, I, I can't speak specifically because I'm not involved in the school on a daily basis, but, but everything you're saying makes a lot of sense. It's making sure that we're dealing with all of the little things on an ongoing basis. As simple as, as our hall monitors checking doors that should be locked are locked. Um, and I think that goes towards what you're saying. So someone has to take ownership of it. It's a great point. Someone needs to follow through and make sure that it's getting done consistently and that it's a thought process that everybody understands on an ongoing basis. So. The number one thing is governance and risk management. 
everything else is kind of tactical. And I would suggest that you establish that quickly. And I gotta believe, and I, I apologize, I didn't come prepared, I should have done like a little Googling research. I don't know what's out there for schools. We are not the first ones to solve this. I'm sure someone else has cracked the code on this or has some kind of framework that we can follow for. Thank you. Thank you. Terry Terzakis, Mixville Road. Uh, my children go to Doolittle School. And I guess I'm echoing uh, what the previous gentleman just said. I'm concerned at how easy it is to gain access to the school. Um, there's only been a few times that I myself have uh, had to come into the school. And you push a button and magically you're in. That's it. Push the button and the door opens. And then you walk in, there's nobody there. There's not a body that you see. They're tucked around behind some walls over there. The one time I pushed the button and heard a voice, may I help you, I was wearing a hat and sunglasses. Maybe I didn't look like a dad at the time. I don't know. But maybe without a hat and sunglasses, I look like a dad and they don't care. That, that's not good. You can't just magically open the doors without maybe an ID, something that says, I have a, a kid here, you know who I am. But to just unlock and go, it can't happen. Good evening. Uh, Wayne, I've lived on Beacon Hill Road for the past nine years. Uh, let me say, first of all, you have a lot of safety nets in place to help these children before they become a problem, before they become an issue. But what protocols do you have in place for the child who falls through the cracks and is still a problem and maintains this violent type behavior, this aggressive behavior on social media, so forth and so on? What plans do you have for the child who's not being helped or who refuses your help? That's basically it. Good evening, uh, I live at 110 Charter Oak and I've been here for three years now. Uh, my kids go to Doolittle School as well and I agree that um, when you ring the buzzer, you basically just go in and I mean there is the, the offices on your left hand side but basically you can really just kind of go. Um, I came from Avon and what they did was in all the schools they had a desk and there was a body at that desk when you, as soon as you walked in that door. Um, you had to sign in. You had to tell them where you were going. Um, and I, from what I gather, it was a combination of the resource officer and then also teachers who maybe didn't have a class at that time. They went through training as well. Um, and when they sat there, I mean, it's like literally you really did. You had to tell them where you were going. And yeah, there were times I had to bring my, my son was in multiple sports. So yeah, I had to bring his stuff in. Um, I had to bring him in dinners because there was no way he wasn't gonna have a chance to eat. Um, and those are just things that you have to do. I didn't bring my kid in a latte or anything like that. But other things and water bottles, yes. But there should be a body in front of that door because it's true that the, the ladies in the offices, they're so busy. I mean, they're not just you know, somebody that's sitting there answering the phone and having a conversation for an hour with you. I mean, they actually have assigned jobs as well, you know, and they do not, I, how are they gonna be able to monitor who's coming through that door? They can't, there's no way. There needs to be a desk in front of it and there does need to be a resource officer or even the um, National Guard, they're here to protect our states, right? Why is there not a, a National Guardsman or woman um, that is in these schools. If working along with the police officers, I mean, that's what, they're, that's what they're paid for. My son's in the Army. It's like there's no reason why we shouldn't be utilizing them. That's what they're here for. And we're not utilizing them. Children, and you're right, you know, the, um, the officer said earlier that, you know, they want children to be raised uh, growing up and seeing a police officer in the school and getting to know them and things like that, and that's correct. And I'm not criticizing in any way, and I understand that they have to go to cl you know, classes and things like that, yes, 
but there should not be a day when they're not in that school because the day that they're not in the school is the day that something might happen. So, and then what do you do, you know? And then that poor, I would, I would not want to be that resource officer. I would feel horrible, you know? That's not something that should happen. Yes. I appreciate the feedback. So, are you saying that you experienced that, you know, you bring the buzzer, you let in, you don't flash your ID? No, never. I've never once, and I've been in the school several times, but I've never once had to show my ID, not once. And like I said in Avon, and even when you're picking up your kids after school too, you had to show your ID, you had to sign in everything, and there was always a body there. Got it, thank you. So, so I was just wondering if uh, Mr. Massian or Mr. Solon, if you could address, I think with the new, um, the, safe, the building audit that was just done, and the safety audit, I think some of these issues will be addressed with that, the visitor entry with something specific that I yeah. think will be addressed, and I, I think Mr. Massian or Mr. Solon, if we could speak to that, can we at all? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, the system that Ms. Vadi is referring to actually um, is in place now at Cheshire High School, um, so there is an expectation that when you come to the high school, you will have to show your ID, and it has to be scanned and you receive a visitor badge at the high school security desk. We do not have that at all the elementaries, but that is one of the things that we are looking at. Um, but that particular system is called Lobby Guard, and you know, I'm, I'm glad that there's a good turnout and there seems to be a willingness to show ID at the schools. You know, I think one of the things that has been true of Cheshire for a long time is that you know, we had these nice neighborhood elementary schools. It's unfortunate what's happened in the world today, but that was one of the, uh, one of the reasons why we did go to an outside specialist to get some um, very concrete um, improvement recommendations. So that is on the list, and it's uh, right at the top of the priority list. So Be Beyond that point, and I, and I absolutely agree with you, Mr. Massiana, that um, you know, changing world, we've, we've been forced to change how we respond and the environment uh, that we have. And I, I know that, you know, working in our community for a long time as I have, you know, back at Dot, I could see somebody walking up the steps from, for the last, you know, three minutes, and I know that, all right, that's, you know, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Smith, you know, you, they ring the doorbell and maybe, we let them in, but unfortunately, you know, those times have changed where we can just rely on that. And I, you know, like some of our elementary schools, the way that they're configured, there's not what you would call like a man trap, it's called, where you, you walk in and there's a natural barrier between you and the rest of the building. And that's, you know, it's like uh, Mr. Massiana said it. This, Unfortunately, we have to construct that, but in this day and age, you know, that's something that we really have to explore. How do we put that, make that barrier um, between somebody entering the, uh, the, the school as, you know, as, as kind as they may be, you know, that we still have to have that barrier there because it's the one that's not that has us all anxious today. Um, from a staff perspective, from a parent perspective, unfortunately, you know, even from a student perspective. So I think that's something that we have to explore beyond, you know, just showing an ID. It's that access. This is a, you know, not that, uh, you know, whether, however we do that, whether it be through an individual at a desk or a wall or whatever the case may be, I think that's probably one of the more significant concerns that I hear from from different groups, whether it be parents, students, or staff. So, and I don't, like I said, it's unfortunate that we used to be able to just rely on our, okay, this person's coming, we know that person, you can just buzz the bell, let them in, everything will be okay, but um, that's not good enough today. If I can add just um, one more thing. When you, when you press the buzzer, at our schools, and I'm, I'm talking specifically Dodd and the elementaries at this point, it's, although it's installed at the high school as well, but 
you may not know this, but the secretary that is responsible for buzzing the door in does have, there's a camera at the buzzer and there is a monitor that the secretary sees. We're actually upgrading that to improve the quality of it, but I didn't want to leave it on the table that we just buzz people in. There is an ability to view that person. And as Mr. Solon said, a lot of our schools, when they were built, and most were built in the 50s, they were not designed as you would design a new school today. So at Chapman, as an example, the office is about six feet above where the, the door entry is. So because we can't um, physically change that office layout quickly, we are putting in a couple of different measures to be able to improve the way we let people in and then screen people as well. Um, excuse me. Um, so I think that the end really, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, you know, this is obviously an issue we, that we need to address immediately. And even if we cannot solve the physical problem of the layout of the schools, um, you know, we can make sure that we have procedures that are uniform and that are working across all schools and that we have the right training. And that is something that, you know, we were already, you know, getting ready to address, but it's clear that that's got to get addressed, you know, that's got to be at the top of the list. Because it's, it's not, I mean, it's not a completely easy fix, but there's aspects of it that seem to be easy. Um, you know, we'll have to figure out because of the way the schools are, you know, the layout of the schools, um, you know, we're going to have to get creative in, on how we manage visitors. But the visitor management piece was something that we already, you know, sort of, it's on our radar anyway. But, but hearing these, you know, stories makes it even more critical. Um, so thank you for. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Just one quick thing. You're saying it's at the top of the list, but can you possibly give us like a timeline? I mean, if you guys, if you've already been talking about it, do you have, you, do you have a timeline that you're thinking of when you're going to really start working on that? Well, we're, we're already working on it and actually, you know, the funding, we do have the funding for right. it. So the um, company that actually manufactures the device yeah. is out of stock um, okay. on the on the kiosk because we're not the only school district that is interested in ordering more. So okay. um, we've already been in touch with the manufacturer. We're ready to go, and okay. we'll place those orders probably within the next week, okay. and then work to install one at a time. So yeah, um, okay. yeah maybe that's about as close a, a, a time frame as I could give you. But we're doing it as quickly as we can get the product okay. in. And again, it's in pilot at yeah. the high school already, so yeah. we know what to expect. Okay, thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Vlad Katsovich. I lived in Cheshire for 12 years um, on Hotchkiss Ridge. Uh, there were a lot of great ideas here. Uh, I was actually impressed with a lot of ideas, and um, so I was initially planned to kind of listen to those ideas and see what else is out there that wasn't covered. I was initially going to second uh, the fact that we do need permanent police officers at every school, quite honestly. Having one officer, or even the second one that we're going to potentially have, is not enough. So I definitely want to commend the, the other person that just came in, kind of saying that we really need it at every school. But then I kind of thought about this later suggestion about National Guard. I think it's actually an awesome idea because. You know, if we're already paying taxpayers' money to uh, National Guard anyway, why can't they be at our schools, even on a rotation basis? So that, that could be really good. And, and, and by the way, you know, having you know, a person from military in school and socialize with kids, that's actually great. You know, it's a role model. You know, usually those people are role models for our kids, and that's great to have them there. And also have it as an additional safety. So, so that's one thing. Um, I think we need to develop uh, metrics to actually validate that what we do for safety actually um, will be beneficial for us, especially in light of specific things that happened throughout the country. Um, I don't know if these things are being done, but certainly something that you guys need to look at. Um, 
you know, I know that in military, for example, when they try to uh, establish perimeters, safety perimeters to defend bases and things like that, what they also do is they have independent units that go and try to penetrate those. You know, they call them tiger teams, if you've heard that term, although it's used for a lot of different things. Um, you know, there was a suggestion before, well, can you send someone to try to enter the school, basically? These are the things that, you know, you can hire an outside party, you know, people that no one knows in the community that will try to do that, right? I know that uh, certainly FBI and others are doing it at airports, uh, you know, I've seen it in the news probably when they try to penetrate that, right? We need to do the same thing here, I think. You know, a lot of things that parents are telling about, you know, doors, you know, not being really guarded and easily come in, I mean, that could be easily checked through those teams. Um, one thing I want to also mention is um, at Doolittle, and I'm not sure if other, because my daughter is at Doolittle, um, they do projects in hallways without teachers present. So there are kids in hallways during the day doing whatever they're doing for the projects. So you can just imagine, right, what could be potentially happening. You know, these are uh, kids right there when someone enters the door. So we need to kind of look into that whole um, situation and really, you know, realize whether or not it's a, it's a good practice for us to do, unfortunately. You know, I'm saying these things because we do live in a free society and we want to have it open and nice, but <laughs> we're in bad times right now. Um, have you guys thought of metal detectors? I know it's extreme. We're not an airport, right? Um, and I know people carry laptops, you know, Chromebooks. So that could be uh, an issue, obviously, I understand. But have you guys thought about that? And um, if you did and dismissed because of the laptops, okay, is there any other things? There are other uh, districts, I'm sure, in the country that thought about these things. So, um, and last but not least, you know, um, the gentleman before was talking about um, governance, risk, and compliance. You know, that's a very big term out there. A lot of corporations, uh, software companies that write software for other companies. You know, security is very important on the software, and I'm an, I, my background is software. We actually send our security for sec our software for security scans by outside companies that come in and try to penetrate, basically. So if you have a website, for example, and you write that software for the website, someone, you know, another party, we hire them, they come in and they try to penetrate, and then they give you risk reports, and they tell you exactly where your vulnerabilities are. These, there are companies out there that do it, I'm sure, for physical security as well. And so, last thing we can afford uh, as a community is to be amateurs in this. We are ultimately amateurs, that's not our primary jobs, right? You know, we're residents, we're teachers, you know, this is what our jobs are. But we need to hire a company, and I know you guys, you know, it sounds like you hired someone or will be hiring a consultancy. It needs to be someone who is not an amateur, who actually knows what they're doing, and who is gonna assess our whole situation here and is gonna say, all right, so this building needs A, B, and C. This you know, building needs something else. This process has to change. You know, we need to have penetration testing and things like that. That has to be really taken at the next level, I think. So, thank you. Thank you. We, just to uh, follow up on that, yes, we are considering metal detectors. You know, we consider everything. Um, that's part of what we're evaluating. The other piece is, yes, we've hired a, a consulting firm that has extensive school security background. Um, th the scope of what we hired them for was strictly the physical security, kind of the hardening of facilities. Um, but, you know, certainly we're not um, opposed to using that sort of expert resource. To your point, we, you know, that I, I didn't have security training classes to be a, an educator. So, um, yeah, we, we are doing that as well. Thank you. If I can just expand that, and also from, from our perspective, uh, there, are, there are some of us that are very much behind some form of a peer review. Uh, I think it's similar to what you're talking about, getting someone who's really an expert in the field, someone with on-the-ground training, someone who's been through the worst of the worst potentially, understands what needs to be done and how it's done uh, to basically look and assess what we're doing. Uh, so there's some of us believe uh, very much in that, and uh, so some of us will be pushing for that. Uh, hopefully the group will get behind it. Uh, I think it's something very worthwhile, and there are very good, even local experts uh, in that arena that we can rely on uh, to do that. So, you know, one of the things that, and I know we'll probably have a few more people, but the reality is this is great dialogue, and this is stuff that we need to be doing more of. We are here to hear from you, and I'm glad we're having this dialogue because 
a lot of good's going to come out of this back and forth, and that's why I'm glad we're finally starting to get into a bit of a dialogue here as opposed to just pose a question and they go on deaf ears. That's really not what I wanted for tonight. I want to have a dialogue. We want to know what you're thinking, and we'll try to give you answers where we can, but the reality is we don't have all the answers. Nobody here has every answer for every question, uh, but I think that's okay at this point because, you know, we'll get it. If we know we need it, if it's important, we'll get those answers. Um, so I'm really happy we're having this dialogue, and I hope we have more of it. So, uh, but I really will support some form of a peer review, uh, as I just suggested. Thank you, everybody. Hi, Elizabeth. I live on um, Bear Path Court. Um, I really don't like to speak in large groups or in public, but um, I am very grateful as well for everybody's time. I know it's late. It's been crazy with the weather. Um, I want to move a little bit beyond just getting into the building. And again, this is the beginning of a conversation. This is the beginning of, of, unfortunately, the times that we live in. And we're all here to gather together to keep our kids safe. And not only to educate them, but to keep them healthy and well. And I think another maybe um, idea that needs to be looked at once we get beyond how do we keep people necessarily out of our buildings or how do we get the people that we want into our buildings is god forbid the unmentionable of when someone gets in our building what are we doing and it goes back to some of the discussions of the parents not always understanding what the drills are what is you know a lockdown drill versus a fire drill versus a um, you know secure building drill Parents need to be educated as to what it is that our kids are going through when they go through those drills. That being said, our children also need to be educated age appropriately from kindergarten to 12th grade as to what those drills really mean. And what do you do when your fire drill route going this way is blocked? And are those drills happening in our schools? We all have muscle memory. Any officer in this room will tell you, you know, 20 years after retirement, they still go for their holster in their gun without blinking. It's muscle memory. Do our kids know what to do when the, you know, regular route is blocked? Do they have those sorts of drills within um, a school day? Do they also know that as much as they need to listen to their teachers, what are you doing for our faculty, for our staff, for the lunch aides, for the recess aides? What are you doing to, again, move beyond getting into the school? What are you doing within the school so that our teachers are the best prepared? God forbid there is a situation to keep our children and themselves safe. Do they have training via our you know, police department? Are our departments willing to come in during the day when our kids are not around to educate our staff, to have them experience things that may or may not, hopefully may not happen? Um, has the district, has the board, has the town council talked about Alice training, option-based training, and just, again, as much as getting into a building is priority or not getting into the building is priority, as much as the physical safety of our buildings is at question, we need to maybe at a later date look beyond that and say, okay, what can we do now to empower not only our students, but the people who spend every moment with our kids when we're not with them to empower them as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sally Anastas, Nolid Circle. Um, and I was just wondering about the after school programs. I have two elementary school kids and they're there three and a half hours every day. And I just wanted to know if they're involved in this process um, and do they know what to do? And also they probably have also a lot of information about the children and how they interact that they could also be working with the schools. I don't know if that's going on. Um, and the other thing too, just actually piggybacking off the last comment is um, again, specifically with elementary school kids, because they are so young, um, if they are by themselves in a hallway, do they know what to do? I did ask my daughter, and she didn't know. 
Um, and I'm fully confident in the teachers that are there that would protect them. But what if she's in the bathroom? You know, what if she's going to the nurse? And what should she do then? Thank you. Uh, just to uh, add a couple points there. With the aftercare program, that's definitely something that is more of a focus for us now, how to better support those folks that are uh, providing aftercare and make sure that those kids are still in a secure environment after hours uh, in our schools. Um, with respect to, to training and supports during the day, we, we have, but not in a while, uh, run SWAT drills in the buildings um, to support the police training, but also for our administrators to know what was happening. At CHS, once we did have a, um, a drill where students in the theater program played injured students, and that degree of a, a lockdown drill um, was pretty intense, but uh, you know th those are things that we're looking at. How do we build more on that, but also what else do we need to do to better prepare our, our staff so that they feel confident to be able to respond to the diversity of situations? Because um, most often we train in a, a, a more sterile situation, like it's middle of instructional period. Um, and that's obviously the greatest part of our day is spent, you know, in the middle. But things do happen during lunch or during changing time or something like that where um, we need to focus on that too. So. Uh, Jeff Natale, Cardinal Lane. And I have a daughter that goes to Highland School and I think that you guys do a really good job. But I do see a couple gaps there also. I'm not going to talk about the buzzer because everybody knows that's an issue and Mr. Massiana said that's being taken care of hopefully very soon. Yes? Okay. <laughs> So um, I think about in the morning, my, when my daughter gets dropped off or the buses come. The buses drop the kids off in the front of the school. There's an entrance around where the circle where um, parents drive and there's um, usually two or three teachers or somebody out there watching the kids go in. But in the, back, in the back, in the playground, when kids walk from Eastgate, they just walk in. There's a teacher, the unlucky teacher of the day probably, they stand out there in all different kinds of weather, they hold the door, and the kids go in. I've walked in that way. And I don't know that there's actually, you know, a procedure in place, the policy in place. I don't know that that teacher has one of those walkie-talkies to say, hey, somebody just walked into school that's not supposed to be there. But there could probably be something done better there. Also, my daughter participates in chorus and other things after school. And at the beginning of the year, we have to sign a paper, say this person, this person, this person can pick my, my kid up from school. But when I go to pick her up, I walk right in. There's nothing to stop me. I walk down the end of the hall, there's a clipboard, I sign it or I don't sign it, and anybody could have signed for my daughter or anybody else's kid. They could do anything, they have free run of the school, they can take your kid, they can do anything they want in the school. So I think that something needs to be looked at there. We're signing those papers, giving authorization for somebody to pick up our children, but nobody's looking at it. So just a suggestion there that you might want to look at that. Thanks. Well, we did try and, you know, limit uh, comments to three minutes because this has been incredibly valuable for us and this is why we didn't engage in a lot of back and forth because we wanted everybody who came tonight, took the time to be here to give you the opportunity to speak and for us to hear what you have to say because what everybody has to say is valuable and it's a learning, you know, opportunity for us. Um, to, to hear those concerns from you. Uh, again, online, if you think of something when you go home, or if you have a friend who couldn't make it tonight, please encourage them to fill that information out online. It is very straightforward. We did not want to make it cumbersome. I know how busy everybody is. Simply asks if you have a concern, what is it? And if you have a suggestion, what is it? It is very straightforward. Um, but that's the sort of information that, you know, the gentlemen at, at that table, um, the ladies and gentlemen at this table are um, some of our teachers, staff in the, in the district review to identify where can we focus and Im improve on things. So I, I certainly appreciate you 
taken the time to do that. Quickly to take a look at what are we doing next? Where do we go from here? We want to take a look at what the community concerns are and suggestions, both from this meeting, from online, from what our security consultant provided. What are those next steps? Where do we have to go? We need to provide more community education and outreach, much of which we talked about tonight, and I hear people in this audience as well asking for uh, some of those things. We um, need to continue to build on our social emotional learning goals. We've identified two goals as a school system through a lot of work going th through PTO meetings last year, through the board, through um, our staff and surveys, and identified two primary goals. And one of them is complex thinking, but the other is social emotional learning. And so we as a district are very sensitive to that already. I think we're at the forefront of um, education when we provide emotional uh, tools for our students. Things like self-awareness awareness, excuse me, and reflection. This is an example of that. Um, this is called the mood meter. I think it's probably the first font you can actually read from the back because we've tried to provide so much information tonight. But this is something that we work with a lot of our kids on. And this is about self-awareness. Where am I feeling today? When you're nine years old, uh, there's a lot going on in your mind, you know. Maybe it's, um, you know, what, whether or not you're going to get a, go outside for recess. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's the conversation you just had with mom or dad. Maybe it's schoolwork. But to teach kids to stop, understand where they are emotionally. And when you see yourself in this red zone, we've all been there. How do we recognize that we're there and health, in a healthy way navigate ourselves toward green? And so this is the sort of stuff that we're working with with our students to help them better understand themselves and their emotional tools that all of us could use um, to help navigate you know, the world. Yeah. So this is just an, a quick example. So that emotional management and then student and family awareness of available resources and supports. In, in talking to Michelle, you know, we want to be able to provide more collaborative information for you. That mental health night would be one such example. And how do we support families to know if something's not typical? You know, I, I'm a dad too, and the first time through, you know, you don't know necessarily. Is this normal? that my kid is doing this and you know for us to be able to provide some of that information around a topic like mental health that is even that much more foreign for most of us um, that's part of what we're focused on and then you know finally work with stakeholders to implement the recommendations and continue to make improvements you know Vin talked about um, lobby guard or, or providing a greater fortitude um, within our buildings uh, taking a look at all those suggestions, work with the Board of Education and, you know, ultimately the council with funding, you know, to, to move forward uh, on those recommendations. So, again, you know, on, on behalf of you know, our, our town emergency team, uh, Michelle and the Youth and Human Services, as well as all of our school folks, and I appreciate many of our administrators being here tonight, I just want to say thank you for coming and offering this feedback to us. And uh, before we close, I guess I'll uh, turn it back over to Ms. Fabiani and Mr. Orris. Um, okay, so thank you again for being here, for taking the time to, you know, see, see the presentation and to give us your thoughts. Um, to the extent that we were not able to fully answer some questions. Um, you know, we all took pretty good notes, I think. And, um, you know, we really, these are exactly the kinds of things that we need to hear from you about. Um, I've learned a lot tonight, and uh, I think that it's going to help us focus, you know, what direction we need to go in and what things do we need to address first. And that's part of what we were already working on, but at least, you know, we now have your input into um, what 
the concerns of the community are and what's most important to you, and that has to be factored in. So I really appreciate it. You know, um, on behalf of my fellow board members, we're glad that you came, and we hope to see you again at additional meetings. So thank you. Thank you again for being here tonight. I, I think this is a great start. Uh, it should only be a start. Uh, it is abundantly clear that this is not just a Board of Ed issue. This is a community issue. And as far as I'm concerned, all of us will have a meaningful seat at this table. Um, we need to hear more from you. We learned a lot tonight. You are our boots on the ground. There's a lot of things that maybe some of us didn't even know were happening or weren't happening. And so uh, please don't be shy. And I know not everybody is comfortable you may work in the school system and you're uncomfortable saying something to someone in the school system, uh, but you've elected us to do your work. All of us have our contact information on the town website. I have my cell phone on there. I answer it. If you pick up the phone, I'm sure all of us will address your needs. Please do that. If you're uncomfortable calling someone in the school system because you may work there, call us. Uh, Mr. Bowman makes a lot of snowballs and he makes me throw them. I'm a good snowball thrower. So make me your snowball thrower. I'm happy to be that. And I know mem many members of both the Board of Ed and Town Council up here are, are willing to do that for you. Um, but in all seriousness, this is, this is an issue that we have to tackle together. We will tackle it together. We don't have all the answers tonight, but I really was looking for as much back and forth dialogue as we can give you. I hope we'll do more of that going forward. Uh, because that's how we're going to learn. And so, again, I thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I'd love to hear more from any of you, either privately or in any other form, and uh, thank you for coming tonight.